to the Me, Myself and Hopefully You podcast. My name is Tariq, a university student, clueless about what I want to do with my life. So after seeing a career advisor and a therapist, I decided to start a podcast where I interview guests from all around the world and hear more about their story. And hopefully by learning more about them, I can learn a bit more about myself too. So if you're clueless about your career prospects, you want to get some advice from people who've lived some crazy lives or you just want to listen to a podcast without a load of ads in the middle, then make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss new episodes out on YouTube every Sunday at 7pm UK time. Ladies and gentlemen, this week I sit with a man who's been around dead bodies for a huge amount of his life. First, as a United States Marine Corps for four years, which included being deployed in Iraq twice, and then as a lab director who dissects real human bodies and gets hands-on, quite literally, with everything that makes up the human anatomy. He's been behind growing the Institute of Human Anatomy YouTube channel to over 2 million subscribers and is the face of their TikTok channel, which has gained 7.6 million followers. That's a lot of followers. Make sure you're watching this. Um, We go from talking about whether the Iraq war uh, was justified to is it safe to hold a fort in to being covered in feces at the end of a working day? Yes, it is a crazy episode filled with politics, filled with feces stories and so much more. So without further ado, my guest at this time is Justin from the Institute of Human Anatomy. So, Justin, I want to start off with asking you a few quick fire questions just to get to know you a bit. The first one uh, is really quite simple. Who would you consider as a sort of role model in your life? A good role model. So in my life, in my life, you know, that would, I mean, oh, there's, there's so many. I mean, I'm surrounded by some amazing family, friends, people that I can just lean on and just for, I mean, so it's, it's all the standards. I mean, parents, siblings, those are all probably fantastic role models because I get to see how they conduct themselves day to day, especially now that I'm a parent. Um, I'm always looking to other parents to see, you know, like trying to extract little pieces of what they're doing so that I can perform the best I can for my son. Um, intellectually, I would probably put it, hmm, that's a really good question. I'd say intellectually, probably Richard Feynman, the physicist, is someone that I have been passionately a fan of my entire life. He died, I think, two weeks after I was born, if I remember correctly. But he was a theoretical physicist who worked at Caltech. He was important for the Manhattan Project, the development of the atomic bomb, extremely important for quantum electrodynamics, kind of nerdy. But the reason why I like him so much is because he is the unicorn in terms of brilliant and also a good communicator because those things don't actually always go hand in hand. You can have someone who is just next level brilliant and just can't really put forth a good sentence in a way that can actually teach someone. And then you can have the exact opposite. But Richard Feynman was the perfect. He was the unicorn. So I'd say he's probably, he's probably my intellectual role model. Someone I strive to be as someone, especially as a communicator and a science communicator, just someone who can know what they're talking about. And then also at the same time, um, talk and speak about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, it is um, It is sometimes a rarity to find the sort of the smartest people or the most sort of intellectually most thought-provoking people being able to teach it because it's all well and good if you know what you're talking about, but if you don't know how to tell anyone else, then it's pretty much useless. Exactly. Um, and my second uh, quick fire question to you is, if there was a house fire and everyone survived, everyone um, stayed safe, uh, your pets and everything and you could only keep one item uh, what would that item be now you have your phone and your laptop with you so that is already automatically <laughs> safe what would be the, the other thing um so I, I i've thought about this question quite a bit and i think the answer is still going to be the same even though i've been able to not play this as much it would be my my guitar um, I've been playing, this makes me sound a lot cooler than I am, but I've been playing for about 15 years. I'm really not that good. I've pretty much stayed the same for 11 of those years. So I haven't really improved in my talent, but music is my, as with most of us, is probably just this foundational part of my life. And it's something that I just, in the darkest of times, you know, you can just pull out the guitar and play. Um, in the best of times, you can do that. It's just something you can always do. And to me, I guess that would be kind of like this recognition that I'm saving that very important part 
of um, my life, and that would be music. So I definitely go for my cheap two hundred dollar guitar that I bought fifteen years ago. That is really not a good guitar, but it has a lot of sentimental value, and I just think it'd be a a smart a smart thing to take with me. No, that's well, that's that's cool. That um, I've always found I can't play an instrument, but I always think people that can play an interest instrument. I know you sort of downplayed your own your own abilities. But like, I just think if you can play even like, if you can p- play like a lullaby or something like that, then like, that's sick because, you know, it's music is so, like you said, you, you summed it up perfectly. It plays such a huge role in, in so many people's lives and you can play it when you're sad, when you, you play it when you're happy, whichever emotion. Uh, and to be able to play it and even make it as well, I think it's brilliant. What sort of, what sort of music do you play on the guitar? So, I mean, I, I started with all the, the you know, the, the, the standards, you know, like, um, some Leonard Skinner, some Led Zeppelin, some Metallica, those types of things. But I, I play the acoustic guitar and I fell in love with the sound of acoustics. So for me, I actually have transitioned again, not very good um, at a very percussive style. Well, I well, I'll literally hit it. You know, you try to play the melody, yeah, yeah, yeah. the rhythm, all of it at once. Um, someone who people might be familiar with is a player by the name of Andy McKee. He got extraordinarily famous on the internet for um, a few songs. Um, but there's just some, it's just, it's fun because it challenges you in all the right ways. And you don't have to be that good at it to make it look good because if you're hitting the guitar and you're doing a couple things, people like, just are blown you know away. You yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. You're like, you're a magician. And I'm like, I know, look at me. I'm talented. When in reality, it took me maybe an hour to learn. It's really not that complicated, but it's fun. Yeah, like hitting it just makes it look like you know what you do. It's like when you play playing pool or snooker and you get the chalk out and you do before that and you put it, you rub it on it. You have no idea what you're doing. I do it all the time. I've, exactly. I've played like three games where you just do it so that people think you know what you're doing. Um, and then right. if you hit it, you go, yeah. But the casual thing when you hit it is you don't celebrate. You just go, yeah, I knew what I was doing. Yeah. Exactly, um, exactly. It's what it is. You mentioned that um, in, in my first question that uh, uh, you're, you're a parent uh, or have you just recently become a parent oh no you're, you're well you're, your kid's a few years old isn't he i remember yeah years. he's almost he's, he's he's getting there to be three years old he's 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 not he's just a little over two and a half so i mean i'm still new you know <laughs> in the grand scheme of things but at the same time i'm kind of learning how to dig my feet in a little bit and just be completely accustomed to it what's it what's it like what's the first three years how would you sum it up crazy it has been easily the most challenging in all the right ways thing I've ever experienced. There's nothing that comes close to knowing that you are completely responsible for an entire human. You know, they're like, I mean, while they have their own personality, but your own little quirks, your irrational fear, all of that stuff gets put and imprinted into them. If that is not enough for, to, for you to kind of like reflect on yourself, I don't know what will be. Um, it's been so fun to watch him grow. He's just like, like literally the most curious individual. It's, it's, it's the greatest part of my life without a shadow of a doubt. And it's that cheesy cliche thing that everyone says, but it's actually true. I love it. Uh, I wouldn't change it for the world, but it's been extraordinarily challenging because I'll say this to the end of my days, kids are jerks. They just are like, they just don't care. They'll be as rude as they want to be, or they, they don't have any filter. So you, ha- you learn patience in a way that I never thought I was that impatient. And then you realize how impatient you are. It's a learning experience, but it's a beautiful experience. And it's something that I, you know, I know kids are not for everybody and I'm not going to pretend as though they are, but man, if you want to have kids and if you find yourself as ready as you possibly can be, go for it because it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, no, I, I've always wondered that. Like when, uh, when, when the kids just like sort of running around and then you're looking at them, so like, that's your flesh and blood that's just running around. That is your, every, you've taught that kid everything. You've, you've molded, you've helped mold this child into living existence, into being. It's not like it's a student and a teacher where the, the student learns something off the teacher. This is, literally you and another person mixed together and now they're one human and they're just running around everywhere being annoying being loud being curious <laughs> like you said it's uh it's 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 incredible it's so fascinating to think about um and obviously i guess you never sort of really understand it until you actually do um you do have have a uh, have a child um 
I want to, uh, before I get into sort of my own questions, uh, I just could you just sort of introduce yourself, Justin? What do you do? Um, when did you start doing it? Uh, and uh, yeah, tell the people more about uh, Justin from Institute of Human Anatomy. Yeah, you know, that's always a hard question to answer, simply because as with everything, it's like they, it's like how far back do you want to go with everything? But I mean, that the quick spark notes, easy, diluted, you know, uh, version is I am a teacher. I'm an anatomy teacher who works here at the Institute of Human Anatomy. I mean, you can see we have a couple of cadavers behind me. Um, I have been working here since we opened in 2012, so 20, 2012. I am the lab director here as well as we've kind of transitioned lately into online social media type stuff. So, I mean, like TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, all over the place, online courses. But prior to that, I'm just an anatomy teacher. That's all I really am at my core. I just, I teach healthcare professionals of all types, whether you're an EMT, a paramedic, a yoga teacher. Um, I teach, I've, I've actually had the opportunity to teach many, um, orthopedic surgeons, even like it just literally, if you are in the field of healthcare, um, I, I can teach you. And that's because I just kind of, I just know as much as I possibly can about the human body, but how I got here is a really long, interesting story, but it's a very long story. The shortened version, I guess you could say was, um, I used to be in the, in the military. And when I got out, I decided I just didn't really function all that well as a lot of veterans don't. Um, I couldn't really find a real smooth way to integrate back into society. And that included going to school. So I went to school and I actually dropped out because I couldn't integrate with, I couldn't figure out the professors, the TAs, the other students. I thought they were kind of undisciplined. It's funny if you actually took me, my current mindset back I'd be fine. <laughs> I'd be completely fine. But when I got out, when I was 22, I just couldn't compute. So what ended up happening is I dropped out because I just couldn't handle it. And I decided, and I recognized there was something actually wrong with the way I was approaching it because I like looked at it. I was like, well, either everyone is wrong or I'm wrong. And I'm like, what's the more likely scenario? And I recognized early on that the problem was likely me. And so I decided to go into massage therapy of all things. Because I figured that was the exact opposite of um, the Marine Corps, you know, like you have, you know, doing two deployments to Iraq, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then putting your hands on someone to facilitate healing. I was like, that's the exact opposite. And I was lucky enough that the school I went to offered a university level education in anatomy. It was the exact same anatomy program as taught at the University of Utah, and which is a world-class anatomy program. So I was lucky enough to kind of find anatomy there and it just sparked, it just turned, it just, it fueled some kind of fire in me. And that's what kind of led me to where I am today is believe it or not, massage school of all places. Yeah, that is, it's a, it's, it's such a turnaround. Like you said, it's like the complete opposite, you know, this high, uh, what's the Howard high, uh, imp impact's not the right word, but sort of like everything sort of regimented, disciplined, hardcore, um, very masculine environment and then you're going into something that's more about you know uh, with, like you said massage therapy you know about relaxing yourself and, and feeling better and whatever and, and a lot softer environment it was a complete you know turnaround um, and I didn't know actually about your military um, uh, background uh, until you actually messaged me and told me about it um, so I want to kind of start there why was it what, what was it sort of like when you were in the military what were you doing you mentioned two deployments in Iraq as well what were they like so, you know, I, so I joined in 2006 on a whim. I was graduating high school and I had zero direction. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And one of my friends said, Hey, if you join the Marine Corps with me, we can be in a buddy program and we can go to boot camp together. I was like, okay, I'm in. I didn't even know what the Marines actually were. I didn't do any research. I, this was literally the most impulsive decision I've ever made. I mean, I end up going to the recruiting office and doing everything there, but I, I never actually really looked into what it meant to be a Marine as well as in the infantry, which is the job I chose, which in hindsight was the most difficult job in the most difficult service that the United States has to offer. 
if I had actually done my research, I probably wouldn't have joined the Marine Corps. Um, I don't regret it, but it was a challenge. Um, so I joined the infantry and I did that for four years. So the infantry, I mean, it's literally what it sounds like. I mean, you're doing patrols, you're a ground pounder, you know, it's just lots of gear, uh, rifles, machine guns, and you're just kind of patrol around. So I did two deployments to Iraq, one in 20, 2007, and then one in 2009. Um, th but that was when the war was winding down, at least in Iraq. So there was not really much combat at all. Instead, it was kind of just keeping the peace, training Iraqi police to kind of take over for what they were doing. We were training locals, a lot of that kind of stuff. So it was a very unique time because the unit we took over for had experienced extreme losses, lots and lots of combat. And then all of a sudden, as soon as we get there in 2007, things completely died down. So very, very lucky in that instance, but that also meant that it was a really strange environment to spend a year of my life in, in that country where you're not sure if everybody, if things are going to go bad or if things are going to stay good. And so it was a really weird place to be mentally, but at the same time, it was a lot of fun because since there wasn't this, you know, it wasn't constant combat or anything like that. A lot of times it was, I got to, you know, help build schools, help do a lot of really cool humanitarian type stuff, which was really, really um, rewarding and a fantastic thing looking back at it. But um, yeah, that was my job it was pretty much just shooting guns, walking long distances. I tell people um, like, what, what are you good at? What did the Marine Corps give you as a skill set? I can carry lots of weight and I can walk a long distance. That's pretty much what I'm very, very good at. Um, and, but I mean, the deployments were, they were, they were challenging, fun, and just mentally exhausting is probably the best way to put it. Um, just because you're always on edge always, but at the same time, you know, I got to serve with some really fantastic guys, you know, um, some of the most talented, insane people you'll ever meet. And, but yeah, and just did that for, uh, four years until 2010. And then, my active duty was up and that's when I came home. And I, had, I technically had four years of inactive reserve after that, but it pretty much doesn't count. So I just tell people I was in for four years, even though technically my contract was eight years. Yeah. No, so when you were there, I know you sort of spoke about um, uh, it was towards almost the end. Uh, well, it was getting close to the end of the Iraq war, uh, a lot less fighting and a lot more rebuilding. So did you not have any sort of, experience where things got you know maybe what your uh, previous reserve had to deal with did you not have that sort of experience was more was your role more about rebuilding and helping these uh, Iraqi soldiers or Iraqi police getting back on their feet etc exactly it's like we had a couple there was there was situations that would pop up but I mean like it's sometimes it could be difficult to really explain just how because whenever I explain it to people outside of the military it can sound severe. It can sound intense, but to those who've been in those types of situations, it's actually pretty much not, it's not very intense at all. I mean, we would get some indirect fire, you know, you'd hear some mortars come from places, but they were never really anywhere close. You get pot shots taken at you from time to time, but those were almost always just kind of like stay out of here, not really trying to shoot you type of situation. So for us, I mean, like we would find IEDs, but they never were, they weren't really going off. We would, we would, there was, the risk was always there, but what had happened was the populace, the population or the local populace, I should say, literally two months before we got there had essentially made agreements with the United States government that they weren't going to attack anymore. And instead we're going to just completely switch mind uh, tactics. They were going to just police their own. And right before we got there, a huge push had been made to sweep out um, the vast majority of the insurgency. So we were left with a very cleaned out in terms of uh, uh, aggressors area. And we were just there to help, okay, teach the local populace how to, you know, we talk to the local shakes and be like, hey, what do you need? How can we help you with this, that, or the other? It was a lot of traveling a lot of patrols just trying to figure out what was going on, but we weren't 
experiencing combat in the terms of, you know, like where you're literally looking the enemy down your sights and you're going and shooting. That just wasn't our experience. Um, and it was literally a month or two. You know, if we had just been a little bit earlier, it was all out chaos. And we got to see the, we got to see the leftovers of that. You know, you drive the streets and you just see a hole in the ground that a Humvee would literally fit in. You know, you drive through entire cities that are just destroyed, but that just wasn't my experience, which at the time, as strange as it may sound, seemed like a bad thing because, you know, like you're training so hard for these types of events and then for it to not happen. In hindsight, I couldn't be more ecstatic that it didn't happen. You know, I mean, it's like in reality, it's like I got to help again, you know, help the local populace open their markets again got to see kids going back to school for the first time in years. You know, like when you really take a step back and look at it from that point of view, this is the best possible situation, but it just wasn't perceived like that for pretty much most of us at that time, because it's kind of like, Oh, here's your job. Here's your job. And then you never get to do your job. It was, it was a difficult thing to handle at those in the, uh, as it happened. What do you sort of make of, you know, you're, you're talking about how you had this sort of, uh, you had the pleasure of being able to see kids going back to school of, you know, a country going from ruins and to now starting right at the beginning of the sort of rebuild phase. Like you said, two months ago, it was crazy. And now you're, you're seeing the rebuild phase where the, the local population is okay with you being there, which is something that would have, you know, been unheard of just a year before. Um, what do you make of people that often say, that um, you know, we should have, we shouldn't have got in there. Um, the the Americans, uh, the American military didn't do a good job. Um, they abused their power over there, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What do you make of those sort of statements? You know, it's it's hard to have the only the only real solid statements I can make are the ones that were my experience. Because I mean, I've heard everything. Right when I first heard, like the, one of the one of the reasons I did join was because I did believe the the cause. Once I got out, I didn't really believe it as much. Um, I don't want to say that it was, I, I, I've heard all the arguments since I, I know how we can have the conversation around like, you know, oil and just U S interests and everything. And I can't actually talk to the validity of that because it wasn't my experience. I could see it. You know what I mean? Like if, if that ended up, Oh, here is exactly, I'd be like, yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, one thing I can speak to is we went and paid off the locals. It wasn't as though the locals just decided they weren't going to fight. I remember one time we were, so the, the, you have this giant armored vehicle called an MRAP and we were loading everything up and there were all these duffel bags and we decided to look into them. We're just a bunch of lowly enlisted and we look into it and it's just stacks. The whole thing is just filled with local currency for the Iraqis. Come to find out we'd been taking that to pretty much all of the leaders in the local area just giving them money. We were paying them off for peace. And it was one of those things that just kind of, you know, I'm 19, you know, you kind of, you think things work one way and all of a sudden you just get hit in the face with like, Oh, like we didn't fix anything. We bought them off. It really affected my perception of right and wrong the reality of the war. I can't speak to all the, 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 the higher end stuff, you know, that's way above my pay grade. What I know is that we didn't win that piece that I was lucky enough to experience when I got there. We bought that piece. I can't say if that's the right or wrong thing to do. All I know is that, again, I got to see kids going to school. I got to see that. So it's like, to me, it seems like the right thing that that's how it ended up going. But, you know, it's um, what I would say is from more than likely, it's just these things are complicated. And as someone who really doesn't have all the details, I don't know that I can say that the U.S. shouldn't have been there, but my gut instinct is, yeah, we probably shouldn't have been there. The whole thing was probably nowhere near what it was said to be, but that doesn't mean good didn't come of it either. Um, so I guess that's just the only, that's, the, that's just my lived experience. You know, it's like, it's, it's different if we talk about, you know, your opinions, but my lived experience was uh, just that. Yeah, I always sort of find it interesting because sort of so many people uh, have obviously opinions, like you said, on the on the the subject. 
Um, but then every time when I hear stories from people that were actually there, you know, regular people that were there, um, I go, oh, whoa, you know, it was a completely different story to what, what we heard and, or, or, you know, sort of the conspiracy theories behind it, if you want to call them that, as to what the, the uh, specific people in the military were doing over there. I don't know if, you ever, uh, if you've ever heard of Jocko Willing, um, uh, him on the Joe Rogan podcast. He's been on a few times. It's, it's fascinating to hear him talk about it. Uh, he was deployed more than once, more than I can't remember how many times he was deployed. Um, and the way he talks about it is is really interesting. He sort of gets more into the political side of it more than obviously uh, we're going to get into. But uh, it is a very fascinating watch, and I do recommend it. But I just always think it's interesting to hear the stories from the the people themselves rather than sort of from the politicians as to what's going on. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, to really quick on talking about that is. I completely agree. And the thing about Jocko, and I am familiar with Jocko's podcast. Um, I've actually read his books too. He's a phenomenal leader. And he he served in Ramadi, which Ramadi, so I served just outside of Fallujah. He was in Ramadi just before I was. I got to go to Ramadi and see oh, wow. everything that he talks about, everything you hear. I got to see the, the, um, the after effects of that. I got to see just the, the entire city essentially destroyed. I was there just two months after everything you hear him talk about. So that's what I mean. Like I, when I say I barely missed it, um, but at the same time, he was on a completely different level because I was lower enlisted. You know, I'm like, um, in terms of, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with military ranks, but I'm an E3. So, so it's basically, I'm about as, in the entry point as you can get, they don't tell me anything. They're just like, hey, here's here's your mission. Here's your ammunition. Here's your flak jacket. I want you to go out there and do what you do. I never got to learn any of the geopolitical problems. I never got to learn any of that. It was so far above my pay grade. So what's been fascinating is listening to Jocko and listening to that stuff from the people who were there roughly at the same time talk about the things that influenced my experience that I just didn't know about. So it's endlessly fascinating to me. And I wish I had more, you know, nuanced, I could have a more nuanced conversation about it. But my experience was literally just, hey, get in this truck, drive over there and make sure everything's safe. It wasn't the most exciting time, um, but it was good work and necessary work for that area. And, you know, that's, just, and I'm okay with that. When uh, I know we're sort of focusing a lot on the, on the military year, uh, but when you're sort of when you're there, um, and you, you like you said, you are right at entry level point. Are you uh, when you have a mission? Are you essentially told? Is do you have a sort of leader who gets told what the mission is? Then the, the leader then tells you, and then you just follow wherever the leader goes. Is that how it works? Or are you then deployed into little groups? Are you ever on your own in one of the missions? Or are you always with a few people? How does that sort of work? So you work, so I was with what are called line platoons and line platoons are going to be, we're all just a rifle platoon. And so we're divided into different squads. Those squads roughly have about 12 people. You have a squad leader and then those squads have three different fire teams of four. So what ends up happening, then the platoon is made up of four squads and then there are four platoons in a company. So our company was in charge of an area outside of Fallujah. And then the platoons got specific areas in there. And then squads would go out on patrols individually. And then the squad leader would tell the fire team leaders what to do. So it's like this kind of top down thing where when I was first there, I was just, I wasn't a squad leader. I wasn't a team leader. I'm just a saw gunner. So I just had a machine gun. So basically my job was just listen. That's all it was. It was like, I'm not making any decisions other than I'm kind of keeping my eyes out. I'm, I'm looking at the environment. I'm talking with the locals. You know, you're, you're doing your part, but it's a very small piece to the puzzle. You don't need to know an extreme amount. What they do tell you is you always get a briefing before you go out on your mission. So they say, this is what we're going to be doing. This is how long we should expect to be gone. But they don't give you all of the details. They give you what you need to know in order to perform your job as effectively as possible. And that's what you go do. And then, you know, so there were times where we would get more information depending on the mission. And other times it's just, hey, this is a patrol. So it's it's not like things were being kept from us as in like, oh, we can't tell them. It's more like 
I don't know that you need to know that. And at the same time, I don't know how much my superiors knew, you know, my squad leader, it, it sounds interesting. Like you have a squad leader, you have a, think about how young these people are. I was 18, 19. My, my team leader was 19. My squad leader was maybe 20 or 21. My platoon sergeant was maybe 24 years old. Like the, it's all just a bunch of young kids, you know? And so to sit there and say, okay, what, it's not as though you can't get a lot of responsibility. It's not that you're unintelligent. What I mean is how much do we really need to tell all of you to be able to do this small aspect of your job? For our purposes, it tended to not be that much. For Navy SEALs like Jocko, it's a whole different game. You know, they are, because they're working, they're doing so many different things all at once, but they're trained for that. For the United States Marines, we are just, we're bulldozers. Like our, that's what we are there for is we are just there to wreck shop and then everyone else will come in afterwards and start policing. We had to change those tactics as the war unfolded, but um, for your average everyday Marine, they don't need to know a lot. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, I've always found that part of sort of military. I know nothing about the military. I never have done, to be honest. And I just find anyone that's been part of it interesting um and one of the reasons sort of why is and you alluded to it earlier about how when you got out of it and you got back into civilian life i guess uh, and you were around sort of with the people that were your uh, were your age um and being back in school you couldn't deal with the fact that everyone else around you was so ill-disciplined they had no discipline in them um and i would obviously assume that it was one of the reasons why is because you were in the military uh, uh, sort of organize it, an institution where you have to mature a lot quicker. You know, you might you might be 19 years old, but at that time you've got to have the maturity of a 30, 40 year old or else you can't do the job. And you're around other people that have the maturity of a 30 and 40 year old, even though they are still in, in, in essence young kids. So um, you'd gone to school, you'd seen that they were disciplined and uh, you didn't like what you'd seen. And then you'd gone into sort of uh, getting into massage and then you'd gone into sort of studying anatomy. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Is that, that's so, what yeah, perfect. Um, so what happened was when I went to the massage school, and like I was saying, they offered an anatomy program. And what, well, first off, what was also nice about massage, that whole time I was looking, like I was saying, for a way to fix myself, because I knew that, I mean, I was never diagnosed. So I don't want to pretend that I have something that I don't, but I would not be surprised if I have an, or at least had a more severe form of PTSD at the time, even though I didn't go through a lot, anything really, really, really severe in comparison to a lot of other guys, you have to understand you're amped up to a degree where you're constantly on edge. And what I know now about the brain is that in those first 25 years of your life are the most influential in the synapse formation of that prefrontal cortex. And you think about an 18 year old who's like, like, all right, this is your job. We're going to teach you how to kill things. We're going to teach you how to do it very well. We are going to, and I don't, this sounds more harsh than I really intended, but it, it is a form of institutionalization and manipulation to create this killing package, right? This ki this perfect killer, this trained killer. Um, to be able to turn that off is literally almost, it's, it's literally asking yourself to turn off the synapses in your brain. And that's not something that is easily done. So that was what I recognized the problem was, is that say if the professor was late to class, um, I, in my mind, even though I wasn't thinking of it in his terms, equated it to something similar to you being late for a mission. And when you're late for a mission, people die. And so even if the professor's three minutes late, I literally view that as like, what the hell are you doing? You're going to get us all killed. Even though I'm not thinking in those terms, the feeling, the emotion is just as raw and real. And so massage, I hoped, and it turned out it was true, was a way to help remedy that, to help heal that problem through patience, through just soft tissue manipulation, everything about that. And massage did answer that. Massage is an incredible field and it's something that um, I owe so much to in terms of what I, I, I view as fixing a lot of those PTSD problems. But what was also happening was Jonathan, who's the other teacher here, he was my instructor. And what happened at the Institute, so he, he started the Institute of Human Anatomy with his brother-in-law. 
in 2012. So this is 2010. I meet Jonathan. He had just started teaching. Uh, he had taught a couple years at the University of Utah, but the, he had just started teaching at the massage school. And after I graduate, I become a TA at that massage school and I get to become Jonathan's TA. And so I then take the anatomy program again, and this is a trade school. So there's morning, afternoon, and evening classes. I'm single. I got no kids. I got nothing but time. I just fall into the TA position and I'm there literally for some instances, 10 hours a day, just taking anatomy classes, essentially the same class over and over and over. And what ended up happening is when Jonathan opened up this lab, he needed a TA and he needed a lab assistant. And so he asked me to come along. And so in those early days, he, is, he was my mentor. And um, I don't want to give him too much credit because if he listens to this, he's going to be like, oh, I knew it. It was all me. He, he needs to calm down. All right. I, <laughs> Jonathan, you need to calm down. And you also need to put my story on, your, on the Institute of Human Anatomy story a lot earlier. There you go. There you go, Jonathan. That you put guy. it on 20 minutes before we recorded. That's why I got the phone <laughs> out looking at questions. Come on, Jonathan. Get with it, Jonathan. Um, he, but he, he, he basically taught me how to dissect. He taught me how to work my way around the cadavers. And what was amazing is that um, he gave me the opportunity to be able to teach all when we had all these students coming into this lab. And then he went to PA school to go be, become a physician assistant. And that was in California and we're located in Utah. He can't run the lab. So he then asked me, do you want to run the lab? I'm like, I guess, yeah, I can do that. I can teach the labs. And what was amazing is I emailed the professors up at the University of Utah who are world-class anatomists. And I just asked them point blank. I'm like, can I come to your class? I'm just going to audit it. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. There's 400 people. You know what I mean? There's 400, like, you're not going to have any proof. You're not going to have any evidence. You're just another person. And what I end up doing is taking the entire anatomy program yet again from those professors. And then I had my own cadaver lab to come back to. And so in those days, back in 2012, 2013, 2014, I would go to class and then I would come and I would, I would print off the lab manuals from the University of Utah. I would sit here all by myself, it's 2 a.m., in the middle of the night with all these lab manuals, textbooks. I'm just surrounded by cadavers and I am just studying relentlessly. And I did that for years. I did that. Well, I mean, I didn't do the school for years. I did that for about, I don't know, eight months. And then I, and that's what kind of really got me really, really into anatomy and hooked into it is where I found a way, even though I had every intention of going back to school, once I was fixed in my head, the cards just fell out in this extremely unique way where I didn't need to go back to school because I had a career as a massage therapist. I also started teaching full-time at that massage school that I was a TA for. I was teaching here at the lab. I was going to the university. University of Utah for free. And I had all of this, these cadavers for free that I could, I was the luckiest person in the world. It all just fell out in this way that where all of a sudden I didn't need to go back to school because everything was just working out for me. So that was kind of like that genesis of getting me from trying to fix myself. That was literally the only idea. It was like, I just got to fix my mind to then all of a sudden, boom, you know, I'm teaching people in the lab five days a week. Yeah, no, that's crazy because it's like you, you, you almost you went from. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Kind of frozen. Yep, I'm yeah. here. Sorry, it's got a little unstable. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's like you've gone from. You I can know, hear you. Feeling like you are, you need to be fixed, like you said, uh, and so going um, and, and trying to get fixed, but then all of a sudden becoming a sponge for anything anatomy related. Like you just want it all, you want to take in and you don't even care about getting the evidence. Like the, the professors, they, they didn't care that you were there because at the end of the day, you're not getting anything out of it apart from the actual knowledge. But that just shows how passionate you'd become because you didn't care about the getting the qualification. You just wanted to learn now. You become so interested in it. You're talking about two, being up at 2 a.m. and just having books everywhere. And I can even imagine it as well with all the cadavers everywhere and um, around you and just being able to investigate and explore. And I think it's it's... And I, I guess, yeah, it is, I do sort of agree with you that it is lucky because 
there's a lot of people that don't sort of get that that they have to wait and uh, you know, so long before they sort of find their passion you've got to spend thousands upon thousands before they find their passion you know they'll do a university degree they'll do it for years they'll actually get finally get hands-on experience and go oh this is actually pretty rubbish i don't really like this whilst you are sort of getting the hands-on experience, whilst getting the free university education, whilst also doing uh, another career as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story um, uh, to tell. I've got, it's a bit of a run, it's a bit of a sort of um, simple question, I guess. But why are they called cadavers? Why don't you just call them like corpses or something? So you can, you can call them corpse. You can call them dead body. Um, cadaver, um, I believe it has a Latin base. It might be greek but it's either latin or greek and i think it might actually mean to lay i would have to i'd have to look into that again so that's one of the things about you know like with anatomy and all of it, it you're basically learning latin and greek and then you're breaking down the etymology the study of the words of it but i believe it's something along those lines it may not be literally to lay but that's just what it shows but i mean there's really there's there's, there's no like rule book that says you have to say cadaver. You can say whatever you want. It just seems that for most instances, people are most comfortable with saying cadaver. Um, we'll, we'll say uh, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I'll say individual. I'll say this body. Um, uh, like it's it's kind of, but for me, corpse, while it's still, while it's okay, it just feels weird to me. It's likely just some cultural thing. It's just some, it's just something in my brain but there's n technically nothing wrong with it. Yeah, no, because I remember the first time that I sort of came across the Institute of Human Anatomy video, which was right at the beginning. I say right at the beginning. You had, you know, a few thousand subscribers. And, and I remember just seeing this and I was like, like I, I can't remember what video it was, but I found it quite interesting because I always clicked it. And I remember going, wait, is that real or is that fake? So I started looking at the comments and then no one was, everyone was wondering the same thing. And this was like, yeah, there's no way that's real. You can't do that. That's not real. And then eventually I found out that it was real because he used the word cadaver, looked it up and find out what it was. And I was just wondering why people sort of use the word cadaver. Plus, there's probably people here that don't really uh, are familiar with the term uh, cadaver, which is which is why I was asking. Um, when you started with, because we sort of skipped over this sort of first phase of, of, or first introduction of you dealing with cadavers. What was that first time like, you know, dealing with dead bodies? I know you were sort of in the military, but you weren't in a high kind of pressure or a high risk zone, I guess. What was that like when you were dealing with all these dead bodies and you were literally just touching them everywhere? It's a great question. Um, weird. I don't know that it, if it wasn't weird for anybody, I don't, then something else is wrong. With I'd be you. worried if it wasn't weird. I'd be <laughs> like, Justin, you still need to get fixed, mate. There's something a lot worse. That, there's something a lot more wrong uh, uh, about you than you originally thought if you didn't find it weird. Exactly. I, I can't tell you how many comments we get that people th assume that, you know, Jonathan and myself are serial killers, we're Dexter, we're something along those lines. When in reality, it's like, if I was comfortable right out of the gate, then yes, maybe you could make that. But I remember as I was headed to see my first cadaver, just the heart just beating out of my chest, just sitting there like, what's it going to be like? I'm all the same questions everyone's asking. What's the smell going to be like? Am I going to get nauseous? Am I going to throw up? Am, am, is this going to get weird? What's this going to be like? Is this going to affect my soul? Am I like, I had all of those questions and every single one of those questions disappeared within the first 20 minutes. And that's been my experience when I have now probably had over 5,000 individuals come into this lab that I've taught in person that's pretty much, that's the, that's the experience of most all of them is that they come in here very awkward, very tense, scared. And then I basically have to kick them out the door because it's so interesting once you realize, oh, okay, these people wanted this, right? It's not as though we're just picking up some dead body off the side of the street. It's like, these are don these are body donors. And you're edu and, and you're getting this real education. It changes your perspective on everything. So initially, yeah, it was weird. It was really weird, but I adapted pretty quick. I've got to ask this question. Does it smell then or not? Because you didn't clarify. It does have a slight smell, but the, pres the preservation process we use, well, I shouldn't say we, I don't do it. It's all done. We use several different body donor programs. They're all over. Um, in the UK, if you wanted 
you could just likely Google search body donor program near me. They're going to have different regulations and laws, obviously. But as far as I know, it's worldwide for most places. We get communication from people all over the place. Like you name the country. I'm not even kidding. You name the country because we're worldwide now. Everyone is asking, how do I donate my body? And I, in the beginning stages, I used to look and be like, uh, okay, how do you donate your body if you're in Norway? I was like, I was trying to respond to each of them and, and, I, and, and it, it gets a little nuanced. But with the preservation process that these bodies have been embalmed with that you can see behind me, um, there is almost no smell. It's somewhat of a smell, but everyone thinks the smell is worse than it's going to be for our lab. If you have any experience with formaldehyde in anything else, I remember when I was in high school, I was dissecting frogs and sharks in my biology class. It smelled awful. It was terrible. That is not at all what these cadavers smell like. There is a slight chemical smell, but formaldehyde is only used in the initial stages, to my understanding. The rest of the chemicals used just don't have much of a, of a scent to them. So it's not bad. It's not, everyone thinks it's so much worse than it really is. Yeah, no, I definitely would have expected that. It, but you, so are you, because you, you're so casual about it as well. Like you're, you're just like, yeah, the cadavers that are behind me, they're just chilling and we're just chilling, we're just talking. Are you sort of just now accustomed to seeing dead bodies now? I would say these dead bodies. Um, you know, and, but I mean, the donors, when I know they donated, it's a different thing, right? If it's a friend or a family member, I don't want to make it seem as though like I'm just immensely comfortable and I'm just like, oh, another day at work. Um, with these individuals, I know nothing about them. Uh, so it's really easy to stay detached. You know, I, I only, I don't know their name. I don't know anything other than their age and what they passed from. And the fact that they decided to do this is also very calming for me personally. Um, but um, yeah, you get comfortable pretty quick. Honestly, I think that's just, it's something you find pretty common with people who work in or around death is that if you don't adapt quickly, it will start to affect your soul. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, in the sense that uh, if you, if you, if you don't detach, I mean, in those early days, I did go home feeling weird. Even though I was happy, I would come home and I'd be like, oh, this is strange. This is a different thing. I had to start coaching myself mentally to be like, you need to leave that, leave that there. Especially some of the things that I would do. I mean, when you're talking about the dissection process, it can get intense. I don't know how I talk about that with other people, you know, like, how's your day, Tark? And you're like, well, you know, I, um, you know, I cut up a body into like 20 different pieces. You know, I was cleaning out a rectum and there was feces every, like those types of conversations are not day-to-day -day conversations. So I also learned early on that for most situations, it's best to just leave it here. And when I'm home, I'm home. I'm doing that type of thing. Since we started making our push to social media, that's changed dramatically. But um, that was, I think, really helpful and integral to me being comfortable in those initial stages. You mentioned feces, so I'm going to have to ask this question. What's the, and I don't even know if you're allowed to even answer, or if you feel comfortable answering, but what's the most sort of disgusting experience that you've had that you've just gone, uh, this is horrible. Um, have you ever had one of those experiences? Because I would say feces is just, I just end up having to go home. <laughs> yes so feces is my least favorite um i have been lucky in comparison to other stories so this is this is not my story this is a story that jonathan told me once about one of the professors who i actually learned from up at the u university of utah he um apparently because one of the methods to cleaning out the colon is you'll actually use a hose and so you'll actually kind of like a, think like a colonic, right? You're actually doing like a colonoscopy and the whole thing is just filling up with water. And then you can actually drain that and the feces will come with it. Well, this is one of the world's best anatomists has this temporary lapse in judgment, forgets that he's doing that and sees the colon. And he's like, why is that so big? Why is it so like he's looking inside of the abdomen and he takes the scalpel and he cuts it to release the pressure, not realizing and fecal oh. water just erupts all over the place, right? <laughs> and which sounds like my own personal health. That sounds like the worst possible scenario that I can literally imagine. I've never had anything to that level. Like that's like the bar. I'm like, okay, if that's how bad it can be, I'm like, okay, so now let's kind of register my experiences. 
my experiences have been cleaning out the colon. I've done that. I've done that a few times where you're literally having to scoop out the feces. And I mean, you have gloves on, but it's not any more pleasant. And you're just, you're just cleaning it out. You're spraying it down with a wetting agent we have in order to try and make it presentable because you want to teach about the, the actual colon. So feces is never fun. It still smells and it smells different, but just still awful because it's embalmed feces. Um, but the one that actually what grosses that me, what does that mean by embalmed feces? So in order to preserve the cadavers, you have to perform some high-end chemistry. You have to literally change the molecules. And what happens is they administer the embalming preservatives throughout the cardiovascular system. So it permeates the entire tissues. It's going to interact with the feces. So feces is still going to be organic matter, which means the chemicals are going to interact with it. It may not preserve it in the same exact way as say like muscle tissue, but you can't expose these chemicals to feces and not expect some kind of chemical reaction to occur. And that's exactly what does happen. Um, it's going to be at a less of a level, but it's still going to be there. So the exact preservatives differ depending on the cadaver. So I have right here, I think like six or seven cadavers around me. Some of them might have had slightly different embalming preservatives used, but more or less they've had the same cocktails. And that means it's also affected their digestive material that's inside of them, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely does. Um, if, you're, if you enjoy cocktails, then I bet you sort of had a bit of a, a moment there where you're just thinking, oh, cocktails um, for feces mixing together. Mm, it's the best. Sounds, sounds so yummy. I bet you love your weekends. Mm, um, after, after a long day of work, you know. Oh, it. yeah. Oh, uh, you know the actual sort of when you're feeling them? I know these are sort of very basic, silly questions, but I've got to ask them. I'm I'm very interested in this. When you the the skin itself, is it when you when you touch it, is it a lot more different? Can you can you immediately sort of tell the difference between that sort of skin and then an actual human? Or how similar is it? Because the way I see it is you're touching these all the time, and then like when you touch it, say you're holding someone's hand, like. I, does it end up getting a bit weird? I know you sort of said you've got to distinguish the two work and home, but yeah. What's that like? What's the, yeah. What, what do they sort of feel like? Feels completely different. Okay. It good. does. There's no way. Yeah. There's no way you can preserve the body without changing the texture. And uh, one way to put it, and I even put this, said this in a recent video, but I've been saying this to my students for years, is you're pickling the body, right? It's no different than pickling anything. So you fill in the vegetable, right? If you pickle it, it's going to change in texture. You can still identify it, right? Say like if you look at the classic pickle, you see a pickled cucumber. You can still tell, you know, that that was a cucumber, but it's changed. No one would be able to look at a pickle and a cucumber side by side and say that they are the exact same, Right. So that's, that's been my experience with these preserved cadavers. Obviously, unembalmed cadavers, those are ones that have been either frozen or are fresh, like you're performing an autopsy. It's the exact same because that's just the way it is. But for this preservation process, it makes it more tight, leathery. Even, leathery is not even the right word either because it's leather still has more soft, uh, a soft feel to it than this does at least in terms of skin. The rest of the tissue can be very, very soft, but the skin just kind of pickles. It just gets tougher. And so I don't, you can tell when you're feeling cadaver skin as opposed to um, living skin. And the other, the other thing too is cadaver skin is always cold and you never, so there's this, there's this thing that happens when you feel the coldness of it, that you just realize this is not a part of a person that used to be part of a person is no longer part of a person. This is this cold thing. And it be then becomes easier to detach from it and learn from it. And it's now going to be a learning tool. Yeah, it definitely does. It, even when you're watching this whole video, you can, that's why I was saying before, when I first ever watched a video, I was questioning whether it was real or not, because it sort of looks real, but then it has that sort of weird, sort of look to it especially the skin and i think leathery is sort of i mean i don't know how it feels but in terms of looks it does kind of look a bit leathery as well uh, which is why i wanted to ask you that question um 
earlier on you saw you mentioned or you saw so alluded to you had to distinguish between the two um you know home and uh, work very early on and that if you didn't it would definitely sort of eat at your soul almost um and when we, when when we're thinking about things like souls you know it's related to things like spirituality and death and whatever has your perception of death changed whilst you've done this job and your perception of sort of afterlife or did you never really have any sort of care about things like that uh so for those who may not know this about salt lake city utah or utah in general but i feel like most people are familiar with this is that the, this is where the mormons are from um and i was actually raised in the mormon faith um i left the faith when i was i think like 14 years old and you know i'm not trying to make judgments about people who stay in it but for me i just there was there was huge cognitive discrepancies that i couldn't really handle um, i remember asking one of my you know the big one was like the dinosaurs type of thing i was always talking about the dinosaurs i'm like well what's going on with the dinosaurs i don't understand how this is working with carbon dating with the geological formations you know it's just 14 year old justin just kind of like harassing my church leaders about dinosaurs it just didn't could you sort of just explain what you mean about like why you're asking about dinosaurs and why that's sort of contradicted with what mormon belief is just because when you're talking about time frames in terms of like when the earth was created, um, you know, like this, like, because the Mormon belief is, this, there's a, there's a great deal of similarity with that. And most of all the other Christian religions, there's some big differences, but at the same time, there's also so many similarities. I mean, they still use the same Bible. They just have an addition to it. So when you're talking like the book of Genesis and just the creation of the earth, it's all the same story. And it just never really made sense to me from a scientific perspective. So what, what I'm trying to get at is pretty early on, I remember probably being around 10 years old, I started to really just kind of question and get to the point where I was like, you know, I don't know that there is an afterlife. Um, and that's kind of where I, I, I've been since. The Marine Corps really, really did a number on this because I remember the very first time I was going to actually go outside the wire. So the wire is, you know, you're in your base, right? You're, and you go up right to the gate, you get out of your vehicles, you go up to these barrels, you put a magazine in there, you then lock, you then send a round into the chamber and load your rifle. And that is like this, it's this, this tactile sensation of just like, the ch -ch -ch. and you know that as soon as you go out that gate, all bets are off. Very first time I did that, I remember just the, the, the distortion of reality, time dilated, everything. My very first time outside of the wire, it was this place where you're like, I'm no longer safe. Just I'm just not safe. What happened over that first week is this acceptance, and it's kind of, it's a dark thing. But so many 18, 19 year old kids, you just you know you know what? If I die, I die, and that's just the way it is. I learned to accept death and see the inevitability of it very very early on, to the point where all I did is I hoped it'd be quick. So it's it's a dark turn on it and take on it but i think it was necessary in order to do the job because if you're in con it's not as though you want to die but if you're constantly like i'm gonna die i'm gonna die i'm gonna die it's like you can't do your job so in order to do your job you have to be able to shelve that and you go if i die i die well then you then couple that with working with cadavers to me it's just been this thing where it's in my personal experience it just seems the most likely thing is when you die, you die. There likely isn't a soul. If there is, I don't know how we can scientifically find it, which is not the end of the world. But at the same time, I don't know how we have an overall useful conversation in terms of objective reality around it. I love having those types of philosophical conversations. Earlier on, when I was first getting out of the Marines, I was became fascinated by Eastern philosophy. One of those reasons is because I was, again, trying to fix my mind. So I was really diving deep into meditation and Taoism and Buddhism. So I love having those deep existential uh, esoteric conversations, but in terms of just raw science, what we know and what my experience has been, I don't really perceive there to be a soul. Um, in my, it, for me, it just seems when we die, we die. And um, that's just kind of, it's, it's, it's this, it's this it's been pieced together from just my time growing up within the Mormon church, leaving that church, going into the Marine Corps, and then working with the cadavers. That's what's kind of melded it all together into this worldview where 
I don't fear death. I don't want to die. I'm not looking forward to it. I'm hoping that that is very far on down the road. But to me, I don't live in this existential fear of what will happen afterwards. You know, like I, I don't sit there. I'm not bogged down by like, ah, is, is there nothing? What if there's nothing? Like, like that doesn't, it's just, it, it doesn't hit me anymore. It's just, if there's nothing, there's nothing. And um, I, and this is a completely different story. I actually did a YouTube video about it. So if people are interested, I mean, we can go into it if we want, but I mean, I got close to death. I almost died a couple of years ago. I had my bowels got twisted and I had to go into emergency surgery. I was going into kidney failure. I was hours away from death. It was a horrifying experience, but I do remember that was almost like this trial to see if my money, if I could put my money where my mouth was, because it's easy to say that well, I'm not afraid of it. I'll, but it's another thing to live it. Well, when it was coming for me and I could feel like legitimately like, oh, I could literally die in the next few minutes or when they were putting me under the knife and I'm like, oh, I may not wake up. I was okay. And so that, that to me was one of those, it was a real big, I don't know. It just, it helped me accept that that truth that I had been telling people for years that it was actually true. It was actually real. That was how I feel. And um, so that's kind of like my perspective on death and working with the dead. It's like, I, I, it makes me appreciate living so much more because I feel like this is what we have. This is the only thing that is really here for us given. So my time with the Marine Corps and working with cadavers has caused me to think and, and operate as though I just want to live the best possible life I can live. I want to, you know, serve people as much as I can. That's why I'm a teacher. You know, I want to be the best parent I can. I want to just make people or at least do my best to ha let people have the best life they can. That's kind of, that's kind of what I've settled on. I didn't know about that story with, with your bowels. So I'm, I definitely want to sort of ask you, I know you've got, a, 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 there's a YouTube video on it already. So uh, I, I won't ask, um, get in too many, uh, too, uh, get in too many details, but what was, what happened there? Well, how did that happen? Um, was it something that you could have prevented? And how did you all of a sudden go from hours being away from death to now being, you know, being completely yeah. fine or compl as fine as someone who deals with dead bodies on a daily basis can be? So uh, we have no idea what caused it. Uh, uh, after the fact, we were talking, I was talking with the doctors, you know, and uh, we were theorizing, hypothesizing, but they were telling me like, what, uh, what happened to me? They typically only see in populations of individuals over 60 years old. And so basically what happened is I was teaching a class and out of nowhere, I felt pressure in my abdomen that I thought was I needed a fart. Um, so I then actually put my class on break and decided I was like, I'm going to go try and fart out in the hallway. And I couldn't do it. I could not pass any gas. And it just kept on building and building. I ended up going home. I'm sitting on the toilet. I'm like in desperately, I'm like, just let me fart. Just let me fart like once uh, if I, if like anything and nothing is coming out. And that's when I just, I'm starting to panic because, you know, it's one of those things where you start to know too much, but the problem is I don't have the ability to actually analyze what's wrong with my body rationally. So I, I know what it could be. I don't know how likely any of those scenarios are. So what ends up happening is I go to the hospital, they misdiagnose me. They think I have what's called gastritis. So an inflammation of the stomach. And in all fairness, I did have every symptom of gastritis, but where they failed is they didn't elect to give me a CT scan, which would have shown that I did have a giant mass of scar tissue that again, we have no idea how it formed, but somehow, some way scar tissue formed in my abdomen and pinched off my small intestine, making it nothing could get through. And what that did is it caused this cascade of events through my, my entire digestive tract where I was now vomiting up bile. I couldn't pass gas. I couldn't defecate. I couldn't do anything. And now all that was happening is that means I couldn't get any nutrition. So anything I drink or try to eat couldn't get into my bloodstream. So the reason why my kidneys started to go into failure is they were experiencing such massive dehydration. Um, cause after I got the gastritis diagnosis, they sent me home and said, look, this is likely to get worse before it gets better, but it will get better. I want you to just go lay on the couch. I did that not knowing that I didn't have gastritis. And instead my colon was slowly starting to die. 
the entire digestive tract because blood supply was pinched off to it. So what it ended up happening is I, as soon as I started vomiting, you know, bile, that's when I knew I was like, I got a big, big problem. So we went back to the hospital. They had to give me four IVs just to actually go ahead. What, what does, how did you know it was bile then and not just normal vomit? The color, the color and the taste. So right. bile is going to be greenish, yellowish, brownish. And I hadn't eaten anything. So I hadn't eaten or drank anything because I couldn't stomach it. And yet I was vomiting up massive amounts of this green substance that I automatically knew. I was like, that's bile. That's coming from my liver. Because what had happened is since the intestines had been blocked off, the bile was getting secreted, but it had nowhere to go. So then I just ejected it and started vomiting it up. So when I got there, they gave me the four IVs so they could give me a CT scan. And as soon as I got back from the CT scan, they were like, we have to go to a surgery right now. Like it's literally just, okay, just we're going. Um, and I remember they just wheel me um, towards the OR. The anesthesiologist comes over and says, all right, so you're going to go under the knife. They kind of briefly explained what they're going to do. Had me count back from 10. Next thing I know, I'm waking up. Hours later, I have a six inch or so, well, I don't know how many <laughs> metric system, you know, like uh, it's going to be, I mean, probably, what is that? Six inches, you know, seven, eight, nine. Honestly, I have nine no centimeters. Six inches. Um, few, just it, more gash, just inches. right. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's going right down the center of my abdomen. And what they had to do is they opened me up and they found this just giant purple mass of scar tissue and they removed it. And it then caused, I mean, so then it was a, about a couple months long recovery process. I had a, them pumping out the contents of my stomach. I couldn't eat or drink anything for another week. Ended up having that. I hadn't eaten or drinking anything for about two weeks. I lost 20 pounds. I don't know how many kilos that'll be, but I lost a significant amount of weight that I didn't need to lose. I had to almost learn how to walk again, how to swallow again. Um, and they ended up telling me they're like, yeah, I mean, it's very, they can't say this definitively, but it's likely that if I had waited another 24 hours, I would have died at home. Just, I just would have fallen into a sleep at home and died of massive dehydration and my colon starting to die because it had been strangulated and no more blood was going to it all because of that misdiagnosis. But we have no idea how it started. No clue. It's, it, it shouldn't have happened to my age group. I was at the time I was 30. There's no, there's no reason that should have happened um, based off of what we know about it. It's who knows, maybe just lightning struck me. Is that, so do we not know how you can prevent something like that or, or is it just sort of essentially a matter of luck? Not so typically it? for most people, it happens because they have some other surgery. So let's say maybe you get your appendix removed. So you have appendicitis, the act of actually cutting into the abdomen creates scar tissue. And then that scar tissue can actually tighten and, and actually block off your intestine. For me, I didn't have any abdominal surgery. So to prevent it, it's kind of weird. It's like, well, there's no reason for it even to be there. So prevention is this really strange thing to try and do. I guess movement, it would be helpful, but I was a very fit individual. Um, I, like, I, there, I checked all the boxes of all the things you'd want to do to be health, healthy and, uh, and fit. It just, for me, there was likely nothing I could have done to prevent it, at least based off of the information we have. But for most people, it'd be movement, diet, and not getting any kind of surgeries, which is really not beyond, it's beyond your control. You know, like if you have to have a C-section, you have to have a C-section. It's not as though you can be like, I don't want one. I mean, sometimes you can, but most often not. That's mental, that. Like, as in, especially the way you sort of described it. Um, about the whole process as well and how it literally started off, you know, and I know it sounds quite humorous, but it literally just started off with you thinking that you just needed to let gas. And then, and then what, how many, how many, how long was that process from needing, thinking that it was gas to, to having that surgery done? Was that within a day? So that happened. Let's see. So I, First felt the gas in an afternoon class teaching in the, so I was in the classroom. I wasn't here in the lab. I was teaching actually in a classroom. By a couple hours later is when I was went in the hospital the first time I was in the emergency room and that's where I was, they misdiagnosed me. 
Then after that, I spent about four, maybe five days on the couch after that. Um, some days had gotten actually a little bit better. There were times I could actually sit up and I could move around and I started feeling like, oh, maybe I am improving. But by that fifth day, that's when I knew I had a problem. And then I went to the hospital again and probably spent another 10 hours in the hospital before they were able to figure out the problem. So it was close to a week from the onset of feeling like I needed to fart (laughs) that passed that gas all the way to me getting the surgery. Then it was another eight ish days in the hospital after that of recovery. So it was in the hospital two weeks. Wow. That's it's just crazy. Now, every time I, I'm going to want to fall, I'm going to be scared. I'm going to be thinking, oh my God, am I going to, is this about to happen? But it's true though. Like, you know, literally anything can happen. But, you know, the fact that you mentioned earlier, I mean, you were in the military. You cannot get fitter than being in the military. And, you know, you said it yourself that you ticked every box when it comes to those sort of uh, things that you'd want in a healthy person. And yet you still experience this crazy thing where you were hours away from, from death. Um, oh, that's just mental. Wow. I didn't even, I knew nothing about this. I don't even know this video. I'll definitely give it a watch. Um, <laughs> life comes at you fast sometimes, you know? Yeah, um, that's you like know a, that... yeah, like it's, I mean, it's like, uh, I've said like throughout the year, I guess, it's like this, if this pandemic has taught us one thing, it's you can plan as much as you want, but like that, it could all just be gone, uh, you know, all those plans, everything. And it's, it, but it, it, it makes me think though, because. I, a lot of people who have those sort of near-death experiences end up becoming more spiritual afterwards for whatever reason they do, um, at least at the stories that I've heard. And it makes me, but you've sort of almost done the opposite where it has almost reaffirmed your belief that, that you know that you're not scared of death. Obviously, you don't want to die, but you're not sort of scared of the idea of death or the idea of an afterlife as well. Why do you think that is? Is that just because, uh, yeah, I don't know. Why do you think that is? So, if I had to put it to one thing, I would say that I have spent enough time contemplating the complexity and beauty of biology that to me, that's enough. I understand how that may not be enough to other people, but it's like for me, whenever I I tell people, if they want to really understand the human body, there are three things they need to do. They need to learn their human anatomy, which makes sense, right? That's, that's status quo. That's number one. But then as soon as you learn your anatomy, you're kind of like, well, it leads you into natural questions. You're like, well, how, okay, but what do I, what happens if it breaks? And then that teaches you pathology. Okay, well, how do I prevent it from breaking? And that teaches you nutrition. And then it kind of starts on it. But at the base level, you need to know your anatomy. Before that, though, you need to understand your evolutionary biology because that teaches you how the human body got to this point. And then you also need to understand your embryology, how you developed inside of the womb, because that explains certain things. Like for instance, this muscle right here called pectoralis major, it's on your chest, but it actually, when you were developing inside of mom, it was on your arm. And then what happened is in utero, it moved and attached itself to your chest. If you want to actually understand how the body works and why it works, embryology is so important. But evolutionary biology, in my estimation, is probably the most important because it gives you, while you can't answer everything, it gives you the ability to ask the right questions to put position yourself to be later on in a place that you can get the answers. What I mean is evolutionary biology is just like, okay, what happened here, then here, then here, then here to lead to this and this and that. And when you start looking at all of life like that, plants, animals, you name it, it changes your perspective to where at least it did for me. I just started saying, you know what? I don't know that there needs to be an, I would love it. Like if I die, Tark, if I die and all of a sudden it's like, there's a, but I'm going to be stoked. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to be like, yay, this is, this keeps going. This is let's awesome. Go, right. Let's go. That's let's what you do this. Like. Come on, let's do this. Yeah. Next chapter. Let's, let's do this. But if there's not, this is enough. This is enough for me because I see the complexity, the beauty of life. I see the purpose of it. And my, this sounds cheesy. I'm a new parent, so this makes sense. But I truly see it from the evolutionary standpoint. I'm like, what's the purpose of life? It's to make babies. It really is because you the, the, you can feel your chemistry, your neuro, your synapses rewiring as you look at that child, as you take them through life. You just start. It, 
by focusing on life here and now, which this is where you can get into all of the, the, the wisest teachings from people far wiser than myself have all been like, yeah, just, just be okay with here. I just don't need that life. And so when I was in the hospital, I was reflecting on, I was like, I don't want to leave this behind. If I need to, then I had, then that, then okay. But this is what I'm really wanting. This is it. And so it was just, it did, it reaffirmed that. And, um, I didn't need the spirituality. Instead, I just kind of wanted family and friends. That's what to me is what life is really about. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a beautiful way to sort of uh, to put it as well. And uh, I mean, we're, we're going to go from um, this, you know, near death experience, complex questions and, and thinking about afterlife. Uh, I'm going to, we started the podcast off with some quick fire questions. I'm going to end it with some quick fire questions as well, because I, um, thankfully, Jonathan did eventually put uh, my question box onto the Instagram po- uh, page of Institute of Human Anatomy. And my phone's been like buzzing off with notifications because I've just got a lot of questions that people get, that people have just sort of sent in and they want answering. Um, have you got a favorite body part? Um. If you if you forced me into a corner and you made me choose, which is what you're doing right now, I got a gun right here. Yeah, I would put the brain. It's just the most it's the most fascinating. It's the easy answer, but there's a reason why it's the answer for most people. It's because it's endlessly fascinating, and you can have the most interesting conversations possible with it. But I, what I would say is a close second, honestly, is the heart. And the heart mainly because the heart doesn't require the brain. I could rip your heart right out of your body and place it on the table and it would still beat about the same as it is right now for about three minutes. And that's because it doesn't require input from the brain to say beat. Instead, it's capable of what's called self-excitation. The heart itself tells itself when to beat because if you get knocked unconscious, then that's a problem because then the heart has nothing telling it to beat to send blood to the brain. So the heart is independent of itself, which is one of the reasons Maybe not this explicitly, but I mean, you can kind of attach it. So maybe this may not be literally so, but for the vast majority of human experience, or at least a significant portion, many different cultures believed the heart to be where the consciousness was, where the soul was. We talk about your heart breaking and all that. It's because you feel the, it's very visceral. The heart is just a very fascinating organ, but it's pretty simple when you compare it to the brain, especially the more modernly evolved aspects of the brain, like the, the, the frontal cortex. So it definitely the brain, but close second, the heart. I didn't know that about the heart, about how it, but it makes sense, obviously, because if you're knocked unconscious, then the, I, your heart still needs to be pumping for you to stay alive. I didn't know that. that yeah. So the, is it like the, the heart has sort of its own sort of mini brain then telling it what to do? Is that, Oh, why is it still pumping? And why doesn't it carry on pumping? Why does it have to three minutes? <laughs> because it still needs oxygen. So if you're not able to, the heart may be able to pump, but the lungs and those things, those have feedback systems from the brain itself, or at least the brain stem. So the idea here is the heart can pump without the brain. It doesn't need its own little brain. It has just a couple little spots. One of them is called the sinoatrial node, then the atrioventricular node. The names aren't all that important. Just think that there are specialized cells inside of the heart that can actually switch its polarity and actually cause an electro current to actually propagate over the heart. Um, and that is just, it's just a property of physics. It's, that's really the easiest way to put it is it's just, it's like a, it's like a clock. It's like an atomic clock. It's just switch, switch. And it, that's just what it's going to do. Um, you don't need a, a, you don't need a mini brain. You don't need it to be all that complex, but you do need it to work. And if that fails, that's when you give someone a pacemaker, right? A pacemaker, when they put that little thing on the outside of their chest, is just a way of saying, okay, your heart's natural pacemaker isn't working, so we're going to artificially do it. But the lungs don't have that. So the heart can beat for a while on its own, but if the lungs aren't able to oxygenate the blood, then the heart muscle itself can't carry on, and it's going to just peter out, and then you're just dead. Okay, I know, I know these are sort of dumb. So a lot of these questions are, to be fair, the questions that I would ask too. The dumb ones are the ones that are mine. The interesting ones and the intelligent ones are actually uh, quite good. So I do apologize if they're just stupid No questions. worries, um, no worries. 
I forgot what I was going to ask now. What was I going to ask? Oh, yeah. Is there sort of a question that you really want to know the answer to about the human body, but we haven't yet found the answer? Um, it's funny because based on our previous conversation, <laughs> me saying that this life is enough, I am curious to know if consciousness is purely a product of the brain. I think that's just a fascinating thing. Um, anyone who delves into consciousness, I think you just end up in that same place because it's like, I, I remember I had this realization one night late in the lab, who knows, let's just say it's 2am again, but it was late. I'm all by myself and I'm dissecting. And I remember I just kind of like casually look up and I just start staring out the window and it's pitch black. And I'm like, if I remove some of the skin, am I removing part of who the person was? No. Well then if I remove muscle, am I but eventually you're going to get to a point when you're removing things that eventually you're going to start removing the person. And I'm like, how much of the person can you remove? And this is a game that I'm not the first at all to play, but it happened very viscerally to me. And I started to go all the way down and I was like, well, eventually you're going to get to brain neurons. How do neurons communicate neurotransmitters or neuromodulators? And eventually you're like, so then what? And that's where you get into the complexity of physics and it gets really nuanced. But the point is, we don't know. And anyone who pretends as though they do is likely either lying or they're just being lazy with how they're communicating it to you because we don't know. More than likely, more than likely, consciousness is a product of our biology, but we don't know that right now. And I would love, love, love to know if that's what's really going on. But uh, we may never know that, or at least not in, in my lifetime or <laughs> anywhere near that. Uh, Hopefully that's not the case because I'm super curious, but I would definitely love to know what's going on with consciousness. If anything, just so that we could also have better treatments for people who have issues with those types of consciousness. So it's like, uh, I'm really interested in things like autism. I'm really interested in um, uh, cerebral palsy even because cerebral palsy, they don't have any loss in consciousness or personality, but they have loss in motor function. Like for me, those conversations are simultaneously interesting but also things that we can actually apply to help people. And that's, that's the kind of stuff that really gets me going that I would love to know more about. Yeah, no, it is a, it is a very interesting question. And it, it would almost help to answer a lot of sort of the kind of, I guess, the political slash philosophical questions that society seems to have about what is personhood, what is consciousness, etc. I studied um, philosophy and ethics uh, last year. Uh, for two years uh, and a lot of the time it would come to the sort of conclusion well how do we define what consciousness is and we'd look at things like abortion and whatever and and and, and being able to come to that so i mean hopefully one day we, we do find find the answer to that question uh, obviously not right now because instead we want to find out the answer to the question of well, how many organs could we remove from the body for the body to still work properly i guess this might get down to what, how you define an organ, because if you look in the popular media, sometimes they'll say like a couple years back, we discovered some, we discovered something that anatomists had actually theorized had existed, or at least no, not even really theorized, but assumed existed called the interstitium. And the interstitium, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's just, it's part of a way of improving your lymphatic system and your immune system. But in the media, it was written like anatomists discover brand new organ. There's another one called the mesentery, which your, your intestines are attached to. Just a couple years ago, I remember seeing an article. Again, anatomists discover a new organ. This is where you start to get into semantics. It's like, how do you define an organ? How is that different than a tissue, this, that, or the other? But if we put all that aside and we just say, okay, the classic organs, your kidneys, your spleen, all that kind of stuff. Well, you could live without both kidneys, but you'd need a dialysis machine. So you could live with one kidney. You could live without a spleen. You could live with, with one lung. You could live with sections of your brain missing, it really gets to be this game of which part of it is missing in terms like you can't live without your whole brain. But I mean, like everyone knows the common, the famous story of Phineas Gage, right? Phineas Gage uh, was a railroad worker where a steel rod went through his head and removed a significant portion of his frontal lobe, if not the whole thing, I can't remember. And he still existed. He still lived. I have a, I had a student a couple of years ago that had a tumor and had a huge portion of his parietal lobe just gone. And so it's like, well, if that's missing, 
And then I make your kidney missing. And then I make your spleen missing. That might complicate the issue. So it starts to get to be this really weird game that's kind of hard to answer. But in my estimation, it's like, could you live without your reproductive organs? Sure. So it depends on your sex. Are you male or female? How many reproductive organs do you have? Could you live without your spleen? Sure. Are we including technology? I mean, I'm not trying to get to be like that person who's just like, oh, oh. but at the same time, it's there's a lot to it. Because if we include technology, people can be brain dead and still technically alive. Again, but it also depend, depends on how you define death. So it gets to be kind of hard. I can't, I don't know if I can give you a good number right now. I'd have to probably start writing it down, but probably five or six, five or six organs, probably without it. I would, I would guess you'd be, you'd be okay. No, okay. Not okay. But you'd, 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 <laughs> you'd, you'd be you'd alive. Get rid of part of your brain, your kidney. You'll be all right. You'll be chill. You'll be, you know, going around. You'll be fine. It's all right. Yeah. You don't need it. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, I need to follow up. I'm getting loads now. See, I knew this would happen. Um, yeah. The minute you think, yeah, I'm getting loads. So um, I'm just trying to pick out some more. Okay. So this, per- so this is something that I've sort of experienced. When you're sort of sad, right? Um, well, this person says, why does my throat feel clogged when I lay down, even if I try swallowing continuously? I would assume you'd have to see a doctor if that's the case, if your throat is feeling clogged when you're lying down. I guess it would def- depend on what they mean by throat, because... Your throat, by definition, is what's called the pharynx, and the pharynx is just it's it's a couple different types of tissues. But you have a nasopharynx, an oropharynx, a laryngopharynx. You have different pharynxes, and but in the in the in the anatomy books, they all look open. That's that's a big thing that people talk about: the difference between an anatomy class and a lecture, and then you're here in the lab. It's like things are either bigger than they than you thought they were, or smaller than you thought they were. Um, it really depends on the artist and how they draw it. Um, but in terms of the throat, if the throat, if the upper portion is closed off, it's really not that big of a deal because then you can still breathe through your mouth. But if the mouth, the oropharynx or laryngopharynx is closed off, you're in trouble because you're no longer going to be able to breathe. So I don't think that that's happening, but are they, sometimes this comes down to people just not understanding, which is fine. Well, actually it's not fine. That's a different conversation as to how we need to fix the education around this, uh, this, but it's not their fault. Um, do they define their throat as also their esophagus? Sometimes people will. And the, the esophagus is the food tube that connects your actual throat to your stomach. That's always closed unless something's going through it. So it would actually, it's, I don't know my, what I would say to you is <laughs> if you're not breathing, it's probably your oropharynx or laryngopharynx. And in that case, you are suffering from some form of apnea and you might want to get that looked into. If you're able to breathe, it's probably not all that worrisome, but I mean, I'd have to ask other questions. What's your overall weight? What position are you sleeping in? Are you laying on your back? You're laying on your side. And we'd have to start really getting into the nitty gritty of it, but um, more than likely you're fine. I just don't know how to give a real satisfactory answer without knowing the exact specifics. You mentioned there about sleeping. Is there a good, is there a position that we should be sleeping that is the most beneficial for our entire body? You know, I used to say one position. And then what was interesting is a couple of years ago, I started to look far more in depth with it. And our knowledge was starting to change. What I used to teach was that sleeping on your back was going to be the better option um, because it would naturally kind of pull your, your vertebral column or your spine into a, a more natural position. Um, the more I've looked into it, there's it's gr- the, our understanding has grown significantly to where side sleeping is okay. It again becomes a conversation of what's the surface you're sleeping on? What's the pillow or any kind of support you're using? Um, are you putting anything between your legs? This is where, as with everything, I wish I could give this nice streamline like, oh yeah, it's your back. Why well, can't your science side? be more simple, man? I just want I the answer to everything and so I can just live a good life. What I What I've defaulted to these days because I'm not a sleep scientist. I'm not someone who looks at this and I'm not on the forefront of this research. So there may be more that I'm just not aware of. I always tell people just not on your stomach. That's the one I know for sure. But I know I'm right there with you. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I love, if I fall asleep on my side, I wake up on my stomach all the time. I'm like a pretzel. It's tough. I'm not going to pretend as though it isn't, but that is the one that I am pretty confident is bad for you is that it's sleeping on your stomach yeah no like, I, 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 
and to be fair, this is a question as well. It's like I'm 19, and I feel like other people my age are similar. Is that we're getting back problems at 19, 20, and obviously partially it's because of you know phones and laptops and whatever. But also it's the way we're sleeping. Like I sleep in my stomach, and I know for a fact that because I sleep in my stomach, I just know that it has had an impact on my lower back. I know it has. Because I wake up and I'm like, oh, that hurts. But it's the most comfortable position to sleep in. So it's very frustrating. But I want to ask you that as well. Or is there an increase in these cadavers having sort of, you know, can you actually be, can you see the fact that they've had some sort of spinal kind of uh, something wrong with their spine because of the way sort of everyone lives and walks and, and the way everyone lives their life? Absolutely. And it's, and it's one of my favorite things. Not as though I make, I don't mean to make it sound as like, I'm happy that they suffered from some kind yeah, of issue. Yeah. Look at your spine, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more that it makes such a fantastic teaching tool. Um, for instance, this one right here, um, if I can point properly using the camera, uh, this is actually one individual who's been cut in half, right? In the mid sagittal plane. And so that means you can actually see her spine very, very well. And you can see that she actually has some curvature like this. And that to me, this is where I tell my students, I do something called Sherlock Holmes aim. I've made that name myself, meaning since they only tell me their age and what they passed away from. So for instance, she was in her, I think it was early seventies and she passed from breast cancer. Tark, now you now know as much as I do about that person. So that means anything else I find, I have to then deduce what's going on or use inductive. Like I have to literally, this is why I call it Sherlock Holmes. And I'm like, okay, well, her back is like this. Well, then maybe she was sitting in a chair for years. You know, maybe she was, um, maybe she was in a wheelchair. Maybe she was just relaxing at home. Maybe she had, like you start filling the, these blanks, but yes, you can see all sorts of postural issues. Sometimes it can also be masked by the way they're preserved. So for instance, the cadaver, you can't see her because she's not on camera, but the one in front of me, she was preserved with her arms like this, meaning she's permanently like this, which means her joints were moved. So if I want to actually dissect her, I actually have to try and move her arms, which is very, very wow. difficult to do. But if she has some kind of underlying issue, it's a little more difficult for me to find that right now because we haven't dissected down and we can't see that. So the, the quick short answer is yes, we can see those postural issues. We can see other injuries. We can see all of that if we look for it and take the time. Sometimes they're more noticeable. Sometimes they're not. It really just depends. Since you, uh, so from that question, since you started looking at things like uh, things, looking at anatomy, have you seen any other trends um, sort of appearing in cadavers that might not necessarily have been as prominent uh, before or at the beginning of when you started? So I know the statistics around things like certain, like, uh, like say hysterectomies have been less common, but they were more common. So that's where you remove like the uterus or the female reproductive organs. What's interesting has been my experience working with cadavers and, and um, is that since we can keep them for such long periods of time, that I don't have, it's not as though I'm seeing cadaver after cadaver, after cadaver, after cadaver, after cadaver. It's, it's more that I get super familiar with the ones we have. And, but I also, but I know the statistics I've spoken with the embalmers about this. I have looked in depth. Um, trends definitely can be there. Like you're starting to see more, you're seeing more back issues. You're seeing I can talk about cavity formation. I can talk about nearsightedness uh, is going to be a big issue that's been developing. Can I see that with a cadaver? Not really. With with the cavities, depends on if their teeth are still in there. A lot of times they're older, so their teeth are gone. Am I seeing trends inside of the, this lab? Not so much other than cancer. Cancer is that thing that just honestly, most people are passing away from in terms of the population, the age range that we get. So that's what I see the most, but it's different types of cancer, even in that. So I can't just say like, oh, everybody's dying from colorectal cancer, even though that is the most common form of cancer. Um, it's, it's just, I see cancer as a whole, but I'm not seeing any insane trends just because my job is more to get to know these cadavers very, very well. And no, and so I, I'm just kind of limited in my pool of what I'm pulling from. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Cause I, I thought that you had, but not basically seeing cadaver after cadaver, cadaver. Well, I thought you would have seen sort of maybe a lot more. Um, or I think I'm assuming that you see a lot more than you actually do. And instead you, you see the same cadaver more than once uh, and different organs of that cadaver. 
And it depends. It depends. Like I say, say if I had gone to the classic, yeah, if I, if I had gone to the classical way of education, I would have seen probably more cadavers than this kind of, it really depends on your program. It depends on your anatomy program itself. Um, it depends. There's so many different elements that go into it. I have seen more cadavers up at the University of Utah because I have been able to go up there. I've seen more cadavers um, at the the body donor program that's up there. Uh, there, because we even have there's even a local body donor program that I've uh, I've been able to visit. I mean, we use a whole bunch of body donor programs, but I have been able to visit that one. I mean, I've been to Body Worlds. I've seen that type of thing. But from a professional standpoint, you're absolutely yeah. It's my pool is actually very limited and. That's um, been good for me because that means I can get very, very, very comfortable with these individuals. Um, but you know that just kind of goes to show where you're not the first to, to assume that, and it's fine. I get it. You know, you like because you don't know how big the space is. You don't know, you know, when I'm especially if I'm focusing on just like body little body parts here and there. You might be like, oh, he just has like a field of cadavers. When in reality, it's like not not so much uh, for our lab. We're a small little lab. You know, we. Uh, we, again, we came around to really teach about 30 people maximum at a time. We weren't planning on teaching millions across the world. It was just one of those things that kind of unfolded as, as time progressed, but yeah. I, and do you, do you pay for these cadavers or are they donated specifically to your organization? How does it? So we have to pay, we have to pay for them. To, so whatever body donor program we elect to use, and sometimes it really just, it really does depend. We have to pay in order to, because it's a business, right? Because you have to fund transportation of body, the embalming of the body, the cremation of the body. There's a lot of actual things that go into that that you're paying for, but you also don't get to keep the remains because you're. We like to think of ourselves as stewards, right? We're basically just saying, okay, I'm gonna pay you to then be able to dissect and teach from this body for the next ten years. And then I have to return every piece of the of the tissue after that time frame. So really, um, you do have to pay, but it, it's not as though like you're just paying for the body. It's like you're paying for the process to get them to you in that state. Um, and it really depends on which body donor program you use because they will have different embalming and preserving methods. So, uh, and I don't know if you're allowed to disclose this, but how much is the sort of process? How much does the whole process cost? And you said it's only 10 years after you have to give it back. What, what, so what happens then? Do they get, like, what happens to the cadaver then? So the, co the cost depends. The cost really depends on, because, I mean, we deal with so many different programs. It's like you, you kind of talk with them, and sometimes it depends on how many cadavers do they have? What was the preservation method used? How far away is that particular body donor program? And how are they going to get the, the cadaver to us? So there's a lot of factors it ranges. Honestly, the best thing I can say is usually it's a few thousand dollars around there, but even that can change. Um, it, there's just, it, it's one of those things that I don't always know until I get in conversation with, with those body donor programs and speak as to what's the current state of things. So for instance, take like the pandemic, for, for example, um, what happened with speaking with all of our, uh, the, the programs we deal with, there were, adjustments made with the, in the terms of say, let's say Tark, you decide you want to donate your body for science and education, and then you die of COVID-19. Well, this is starting to change. What would have happened is they would have just cremated your body right to begin with. They weren't even letting you be preserved and then being put out um, to go teach because we just didn't understand uh, SARS-CoV-2 enough to be able to say, okay, we're just going to start, oh, you died of COVID? Here we go. We're just going to start dishing out these bodies. So what that did is it actually, I don't know if it crippled the right word, but it had a tremendous effect on the availability of bodies worldwide. So in that instance, it makes sense for the overhead of these more, uh, you know, these mortuaries, right? Some of these are mortuary schools. These are mortician, uh, you know, like mortuary science schools. They may have to elevate the price in order to keep the business afloat, right? Like we all know just the, the, the ripple effect everything's had on the economy. It's affected the body donation process just the same. So we haven't, it's, it, it, there's so many factors that go into the cost, but I think a real nice baseline is just is, is somewhere around a few thousand dollars. Um, but that can be much higher. It can be much lower. It just really depends. And in terms of what we do with them, is we keep every piece of tissue. And then when their time is up, 
however long we elected by contract to keep that that uh, body, we then return it. We return the body and everything we removed. I mean everything. Like it's not as though we're just throwing away pieces of tissue. We keep everything in a container and all of it gets cremated at once. And every bit of those cremated remains or more easily just called cremains can actually be given back to the family if they chose for that route. Otherwise they can be um, just kind of taken to a local cemetery and placed in a common burial uh, location in the cemetery. When you're, um, and I've only, I've got only a few questions because I know we've gone well, like an hour and a half already in. Um, uh, when, because obviously you have to give every single body part back. Do you give back, I don't know how to explain it. Is it all in one coffin, the entire cadaver, and then you put it back where it was or do you put it in separate containers or what, how does that work? It really depends on the state of the, of the cadaver because sometimes w- when we make a cut, we make a dissection, we do that asking ourselves, what can we teach from it, right? So say if I want to remove a leg, well, there's many ways I can remove that leg. So then I will then make that decision. We execute that dissection. Obviously, you can't just put it back together. And who knows, maybe over the years, I may dissect that same body part multiple times. And maybe it becomes more segmented. In that case, transporting them back in the same container, whether it's a, whether it's like a makeshift coffin or a body bag or anything like that, sometimes that's just not overly practical. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. It really depends on the state of the cadaver at the end of their time here. Um, sometimes, yes, it's really literally as simple as just it all goes back together. The body, we didn't dissect all that much because that wasn't our purpose with that cadaver. We wanted to just show a couple things. Other times, it's like it may be in several different uh, pieces. It just, it again, it depends. Oh, right. Okay. Um, and the cadavers that have, uh, you mentioned earlier on, obviously the COVID-19 ones, they automatically be cremated, even if you, you wanted to be, uh, you wanted your body to be used uh, for science. Um, or have you dealt with um, a cadaver that's uh, passed on because of COVID-19? And uh, is there sort of any new research from the anatomy side that people are seeing that, oh, look, this is a common thing for people that had, that died of COVID um, that we're seeing? Or is that going to happen later on? So dealing with the, with the programs we're dealing with, um, we have not had any bodies who passed from COVID-19. The, the information that we've gotten from the programs we deal with is that they're just not doing it at this time. Or if they are, and this makes perfect sense, they're utilizing those cadavers for medical students. And that makes all the sense in the world to me, right? If you're going to, if you're going to be able to utilize those bodies, you might as well give it to those who are going to be on the front lines of treating such a, you know, such a large problem as the pandemic. So to give it to us as a gross anatomy lab, when I say gross, I just mean large, uh, not, not disgusting, but as a gross anatomy lab who we just teach, you know, we're, we're teaching online. Yes. But I mean, our main thing has been like EMTs and paramedics. We don't need, we don't need, you know, the, these highly specialized bodies to be able to perform those general tasks of just informing people about basics of their body. But man, I would love it. I would, I, I would love to have a body, and I could look at the lungs, I could look at the cardiovascular system of someone who passed from COVID nineteen. I look at the data, I look at what I can see, but that's the same stuff that's available to everyone else. That's available to me, and you're kind of trying to piece it together. But like I was saying, like some t- as soon as you see something for in the in the lab with your own eyes and get to touch it and feel it, it's a completely different ball game. And so I wish, and this is changing. I wish we could get one of those bodies. Again, I don't wish any harm upon anyone. It, this to me though, as I'm like, okay, we now have reach among all of our different social profiles. We have over 8 million followers or subscribers across every single thing. I mean, the imagine what we could do if we did have visible um, uh, it's the visible signs on the lungs from COVID-19. What could we show with that? What could we teach? It, it's amazing the reach that we could have. And so I really am chomping at the bit to get lungs like that, but it's just not been made available to us. I don't know when that will be made available, um, but we are hopeful that it's sooner rather than later. Yeah, hopefully. And it does, like you said, make sense that it goes to medical students first for, you know, I I think it will be, I've said this as well. I said, I can't wait for 10, 20 years when we actually, because in the grand scheme of things, we know nothing about this virus. 
Like, that's why uh, policies all around the world are completely different. Some people are like, you can be with 30 people. Some people are like, you can't be with anyone. You know, all this other stuff. Because we know so little. And in like 20, 30 years, however long, one day we're going to find out, one, why does everyone have so many completely different symptoms? Some people die and some people get absolutely nothing and they could be the exact same age. And it, it's just fascinating. Uh, and I do hope that you guys get your hands on, on one of those as well. My, my final quick question to you before my final question is, and I don't know if you know the answer to this question, uh, but someone asked, um, uh, wait, let me get it up. Why do we need to feel slash show emotions, for example, crying? And is it bad to keep the emotion in? I don't know if you know the answer to that question. Emotions are fascinating because we as human beings are the most communicative species we know of on the planet. Um, your eyes are very, very good at figuring out how people feel and what they're thinking based off of subtle body language. Um, and emotions play into that. Like an example I like to give to people is your eyeballs, the fact that you have white on the outside, and then you have the darkened irises and the darkened pupils. If you look at a lot of other creatures, they have pure dark eyes. It's not black, but they have very darkened eyes. And that is to mask their eyes. But for you, you actually advertise your eye movement. So like Tark, if, I, if we were, say like we're hunting, right? And we, did, we wanted to sneak up on something. I wouldn't even have to say anything to you. I could just move my eyes very subtly and you could pick up on my meaning. To, it's really difficult to overstate how important body language is and communication is for us as human beings. Our ability to have so many different languages not even just languages, dialects of those languages, when you add everything that goes into it, it's insane how communicative we really are. Not only are, do we speak literally, we speak metaphorically, allegorically. I can, I can tell you a story and you can abstract what that, the meaning of it that's packaged inside of it. I don't know this, but I don't know that dolphins can do that. I don't know that a rat could do that. My, um, emotions add a different layer. So when you're talking about what is the purpose of emotions or crying, it's literally just saying, this is how I feel. There's all sorts of these. Like, here's an interesting one. Why do we blush? One of the ideas is, is it's immediate authenticity because no matter what I'm saying, you know, the truth of it. If I could say anything, you're just like, are you embarrassed? I'm like, no, no, I'm not embarrassed, but I'm just flushed. Red. You know, that I'm embarrassed. You know the authenticity. Crying is a very similar one. If you're crying and you're happy, you're crying when you're sad, but it's one of those things you can't hide. And so it shows um, the, just the genuine feelings. So when you ask, is it best to hold them in? I think that's actually more situationally dependent than people want. Um, in certain instances, it may be. In other instances, it may not. I, if you forced me into one answer, no, I think it's better to show your emotions. Um, but then I would add, and that's where it gets into that philosophical aspect of, but you shouldn't let them control you. <laughs> so it's okay to be emotional. It's okay to let people see that side of you, but it, you shouldn't act solely based off of that and just say, oh, I'm, I'm just an emotional person. It's like, well, that's, that's, that's not carte blanche for you to be like a, a dick. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> you've got to be able to control yourself. So emotions are fantastic ways to communicate. That is what they're there for. Is there anything that can harm the body by not, by trying to, put down those emotions that like when you want to cry forcing yourself not to cry is something going to negatively happen to your body or is that not the case um i think it would depend on the emotion and the severity of it i mean i even did a video on this called broken heart syndrome on our youtube channel it's called a uh, takotsubo cardiomyopathy broken heart syndrome and what can happen is in tremendous amounts of stress this typically happens to females over the age of 60 what will happen is they get what's called an apical ballooning of their left ventricle. So their heart will balloon out and it looks like an octopus trap. That's what takotsubo means in Japanese. And that is due likely to a huge injection of cortisol and epinephrine, which are the hormones of stress um, and just kind of like that fight or flight mode. And it's just affecting the heart. Um, but they're also over 60 typically. And, and they also have a really high recovery rate too. People don't typically die from it, but they're not really holding that motion in. It's just a really intense emotion. I don't know that you have any much, if any control over that. 
I don't know that I know enough to definitively say like, um, there's going to be a lot of immense physical harm that we can see, but I do know that the psychological harm that can manifest is enough to warrant, um, not holding in those really intense emotions. Uh, that's what I would be more concerned with rather than say like some other physical thing happening. Um, that I see is probably less likely except when you start introducing cortisol because cortisol does do a whole variety of things to your body. But again, it comes down to how long are you holding in? What is the particular emotion? What's your overall state of health? And then it's just, you get into that, that whole, uh, thing of just question after question. Yeah, no, this is uh, uh, this perfectly links to uh, a recent episode that I recorded. It will be uploaded before this one. It's the one with rugged counselling. So make sure you check that out. He's sure. a mental health therapist. Um, uh, and I asked him the question, sort of the impact of uh, mental health on the human, the physical human body as well. Um, I know I said it was just the last quick question, but I forgot to ask it's this fine. one. And it links back. And it's, it's quite a... a not the, the, the sort of nicest question, considering your own experiences. But is it bad? hold your fart in and yeah what what happened like yeah is it bad to hold your fart in because some people say because apparently and i don't know how true this was but there was a, an, oca- an occasion where someone held their fart in and then they went up to their brain or something like that or they went <laughs> inverse something and something happened so is it bad to hold your fart in? uh not typically but the reason why is because it's going to find its way out one way or the other um and then the question is how bad is it so here's one thing to think of um, your, uh, I think it's, I may be wrong. It doesn't that the percentage doesn't matter, but I do know that either the majority or really close to the majority of your farts are actually swallowed air. It's not even that you're, it's like, it's particularly stinky. It's not as though your bacteria are making much. It's just literally air you swallowed, made its way down when it, it goes to show that it, look, if you close off your anus and you don't let that actually escape, there's other sphincters that it's possible that same air that gas could go out or it is also possible that the anus may not be perfectly closed and it might let small amounts out it has to go somewhere and the body is not just going to let you injure itself it's kind of like if you have to urinate really bad sometimes people ask me can the kidneys explode i'm like absolutely except i've looked into it and it's happened so few times that you might as well say it's outright impossible because from your body's perspective it's not going to be like I'm just going to hold this in and let my kidneys explode as opposed to just peeing my pants. You know, like your body's going to aggressively urinate to save your kidneys. If it got to be the point where you're about to experience significant damage, you're just going to fart. You're just, you know, your, your anus is just going to open. You're going to pass the gas because that is the far better option and your body's going to take over. It's the same reason why you can't really hold your breath to pass out. I mean, is it possible to do, but Yes, but for the vast, vast, vast majority of people, it's not likely to happen because your body's not going to let it happen. Interesting. And if you if you ever do need to like pass gas and you're around people, here's a tip: get your hand, put it in your pocket, and then spread your one of your cheeks to the other side. And it basically, what happens, like, as in spread it away from the crack. Yeah, say the cracks here. Get your hand, spread it out that way, and then essentially it'll make no sound. I'm telling you, it works. It's a brilliant hack. And then walk away. Do not stay in the same position. Walk away. And then people will just be like, what's that smell? But you'll be all the way over there. They're not going to think it's you. So that's brilliant. That is, yeah, it's a brilliant trick. It Thank is, you. Um, I, I will try that today probably. Because no, knowing me, I'm going to have um, and I'm just I will try this out. Name well, a sign. I mean, I, knowing you, you should definitely fart every single time you need a fart. Never hold oh, yours in. Because Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. a proud farter. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. I mean, that, especially after your experience, just let it out. Just let it out, whatever, <laughs> even if whatever it is the case, just let it out. Um, but yeah, it was an absolute pleasure having you on, Justin. I have one final question to you. It's a question that I ask everyone uh, that comes on is if you, when you were young, you obviously, you were in the military at 19 years old, very young. Uh, what sort of advice would you give to people who are around that age, 19, 20, 21? What sort of life advice would you give to them? Don't worry about what you're supposed to do or what's cool or anything like that, uh, get out of your head. I, I was a bad student when I was in high school and younger and obviously in college, that was a different reason. But I remember, I will remember this to the day I die. I was, we were getting out of the Marine Corps and when you're getting out, they have, um, no use for you. Like say like, so, so if everyone else is going to start deploying, but you only have a couple months left in your service, they have, they're not going to send you and waste money on you to train. So they actually will put you in these little, 
units that are just there to exist. You're just waiting out your time. And one of the opportunities I had was to start taking some college classes, but I took it with some of my friends that I'd served with. And I remember we're in a math class and I just start goofing off like I did all throughout high school and everything. And my buddy, I had served with him for four years now. He just turns around and he's like, my last name's Coddle. He's like, Coddle, you know, it's okay to be smart. And I just like, I've even told him about this. And I, and I just like, in that moment, it just hit me. I'm like, what are you doing? What are like, really, what are you doing? And even if people already understand it's okay to be smart, I don't know if maybe this is just me and maybe I'm just highlighting my own insecurities here. I know that I was far more concerned with how I presented and how I looked, what I was really interested in at that age than I am now. I could, I could care less. Um, at this point. And I'm, I'm assume it's just going to continue until I'm that guy in his, you know, underwear on his porch, just sitting there, you know, yelling at the kids. I look forward to that day when I just have, I don't care at all. I just, I think if you're wasting your time on what your parents, friends, family, everyone, all the, not as though you shouldn't respect their decisions and their opinions. Absolutely. I'm not just saying be chaos and just like, I'm going to do what I want whenever I want. But at the same time, like, don't worry so much because if you do what you want and you do it earnestly, you do it with the best of intentions, it's going to work out. I don't know if it's going to work out for you when you're 19 or 20, but it's going to work out. The Marine Corps was a terrible decision in hindsight in terms of I did no research, and, but because of that, I, and I did it authentically, it primed me to be the most an obscene amount of discipline to the point where I will hyper focus. I, you give me a task, I will obliterate it. If you give me anything, you're like, go grab the groceries. I will be the best at getting the groceries that's ever existed. Gro- he'll be the best grocery gra- grabber you'll ever see. Can't, you can't beat me. It's a new Olympic sport. All right. I, I will be the single best. And that don't, and the, but the thing is, I don't do that to be better than anyone else. I do it because. I want to actually be the best that I can be. And I think that you don't have to go through the military to have something like that. It's really just an understanding of, you know what? It's okay to not please everyone around me. Instead, I'm going to do what I really want to do. That would be my advice. That's it for this week's episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, It was an absolute pleasure to have Justin on. And I do appreciate it when people like Justin uh, take their time to come on uh, to the podcast. A very small podcast. But it very, you know, grow, growing very slowly. Um, but it is always a pleasure, and I learned so much about the human body, about the human anatomy, um, uh, like I always have done for for a few years now with the Institute of Human Anatomy YouTube channel. I'm sure you've seen it pop up on YouTube about something about your muscle or whatever, or pop up on uh, on their TikTok, which you know it seems to be going viral every other day. Uh, I wish mine went viral every other day, but it doesn't. Um, Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Uh, Like I said, huge thank you to Justin. If you are watching this, Justin, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Hopefully we can do a bit of a part two, maybe do more of a QA. and a I don't know. If if you're interested, then let me know in the comments below. Uh, And other than that, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode. And share us on social media, tagging at MMHYpodcast on Instagram. Other than that, thank you so much again for watching. Have a great week. Until next time.